good morning students good morning to all you can watch youtube live and facebook live also anyone facing an admit disturbance you can join there also facebook live and youtube live is also going on please check it within one minute sir will join if anyone your friends did not had joined please inform to them let them join as early as possible please inform to your friends also let them join as early as possible Good morning to all students. Please inform your friends who has not joined. Let them join as early as possible. Within one minute, Sir will join and the section will be start. YouTube live and Facebook live is also going on. Please check it there also. Students, my voice is visible or not? Please inform. Up to sir coming. I will put a screen screen sharing as our brochure. Okay. Hello, uh, Mayashuri, can you hear me? Hello, yes, Mayashuri, can you hear me? Sir, we can't hear your voice. You can't hear me? Okay. Uh, second, remove the headset to the system. Then set as uh, OK and the speaker symbol. Please set at uh, speaker symbols. Mm -hmm. 
No, sir. We can't hear. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Right side. Hmm. La uh, date to language uh, speaker symbol will be there. There you have to set headphones. Okay. Uh, where where you are saying exactly? Can you just repeat again? We can't hear your voice. At the right yeah. side, you will have a symbol settings speaker settings. Did you got it, sir? Or uh, Windows button F8 or F7 in your laptop? F8 or F9 will be uh, mute symbols. Check it, sir. Your keyboard. At the top, key buttons will be there. F8, F9, F9. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm just doing that. Yeah. Once remove the headsets and once you can speak it. Can we check yeah, like can that? Can you hear me now? No, sir. We can't hear your voice. Still now. How about this? Now can you hear me? Can you speak now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, now it is okay. All right, so I think it's just removing and uh, putting it again <laughs> works. All right, yeah. so great. Uh, let me just put up my screen and then just you can confirm if you can see my screen. Okay, just yeah, one okay, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, screen also visible. Yeah, I'm yeah. putting my presentation. Yeah. Yeah, okay, sir. Just hide. Yes. Yeah. Can you see, can you see my slides? Yeah, I can see, sir. And my voice you can is, my voice is clear? Yeah. Good right, morning morning to all. Please inform to your friends who has not still not joined. Please let them join. YouTube live and Facebook live is also going on. Sir, you can start the section. All right. Uh, so very good morning to all of you. Uh, good morning to uh, a special uh, greetings to Mayeshwari for for setting up all this thing and, and uh, keeping everything on track. Um, and good morning to all the participants who are joining from different parts of Andhra Pradesh and from rest of the country. Uh, so today, uh, before I start, I uh, would like to uh, mention that today is, the first, today is the last day of 2020 and I'm glad that uh, we are all connecting on this last day of 2020, uh, which has been a real tough year for, across, for everyone across the world. And uh, I'm sure 2020 for everyone uh, would be better than 2020. And uh, let's hope that the uh, uh, world would be a better place uh, in, in this coming year, starting from tomorrow. And uh, particularly today's lecture is, is, uh, is an opportunity to connect with all of you and uh, on the last day of 2020. So I'm glad that uh, on, uh, we are going to talk for next hour, hour and a half or a couple of hours uh, on something related to science. And uh, we will end this year on a high note. And I wish uh, all the very best to all of you 
and uh, hope that you all will be very successful and uh, we all of you will be safe uh, and then you will be healthy and will have a prosperous year ahead of uh, of you in 2021 so today uh, what i'm going to talk about is um, as we have started from uh, drug discovery and development uh, we covered the introductory part we have talked about adme uh, we, uh, we have talked about in vivo pharmacokinetic studies we have talked about alternatives to animals so now today slowly we would like to connect um, to toxicology but before we really start talking about toxicology the safety studies we should understand the importance of laboratory animals so we'll try and understand uh, like uh, why should we use laboratory animals all of you know uh, why we should use that but we'll just touch base on that which are the common species which are being used uh, for drug discovery and development uh, especially in preclinical uh, in vivo testing and how these laboratory animals are maintained now uh, laboratory animals uh, are there are different species uh, what are the uh, conditions uh, environmental conditions and uh, other uh, managemental things uh, if you want to maintain a, a laboratory animal facility at your place and then uh, in education also it has a real good importance uh, and then we will try to connect into animal handling in before we start discussing about toxicology okay because toxicology or efficacy studies none of the studies can be done uh, in vivo studies unless you understand the basics of laboratory animals the science of laboratory animals so i thought as a bridging uh, topic let's cover uh, in today's discussion everything about laboratory animals okay so laboratory animals as uh, all of you know these animals are used as tool for investigation okay Uh, of course these are live systems these are uh, live biological system used for investigation what investigation it could be uh, to understand the pharmacokinetic properties of a compound to understand the efficacy of a compound or it could be the safety related uh, issues which may arise because of administration of your drug uh, either for a short duration or a long duration so for all these investigations you have to use animals especially laboratory animals so the question here is why use animals we already have touched base this a uh, couple of uh, i mean almost a week ago when we were talking about alternatives to animals but still see uh, as as a student you should know that uh, yes animals are live system but sometimes uh, uh, now all of you very well know the, the drug discovery development funnel which we have talked about that you start with thousands of molecules right and by the time you reach human clinical trial you are hardly left with few compounds which you can count on your fingertips so that screening process if you want to do an effective screening of your molecules then of course you have tools like in silico screening where using softwares we try to look at the liabilities of the of the structure under investigation or we also try and look for the pharmacophore the binding uh, in the 3d structure uh, from efficacy point of view all those things are fine but still it is an in silico way of screening the compounds so then you can do in vitro assays so many of the compounds which may have solubility or a permeability or any other liabilities like metabolism they can still be screened using in vitro assays but then finally the best of your molecules the lead compounds when you try to optimize those lead molecules and uh, you want to take those molecules further then before before human trials there comes the usage of animals so as you can understand every molecule cannot be tested in human so you need in between the species where we can get some idea about the pk properties or about the efficacy or the safety of your molecule so like so one of the person has asked a question last week that since the predictability from animal to human is is less because the genome is different still why should we use animals so the answer is you cannot test every such molecules into human right so from a welfare from an ethics pers pers perspective it may not be uh valid and and uh, you may not get that many volunteers because you know even though we do so much of screening 
still until unless entire safety uh, studies has been done you don't know if uh, any of this uh, compounds uh, are are hazardous or in terms of efficacy how much they are effective so rather than testing directly in human in between comes the animal phase which is laboratory animal testing okay i i can uh, understand that some of you may feel that um, it is still unethical because animals are also live species i completely agree with you and uh, i know it is little selfish on part of human to consider this but in a hierarchy human is at the top right uh, so we tend to take this advantage over lower species so i know it is not that ethical to consider but still you know we may have to accept this that yes uh, as a human we have certain advantages over other species that's why we tend to do the testing in laboratory animals and only limited few drugs will go further for human trials okay and what are the positives of testing in animals so basically this is also a live system right so they do have entire organ systems well expressed completely operational functional state they have metabolism uh, characteristics their liver does express cytochrome p450 enzymes so they also do the metabolism so the enzyme system is also similar so they are highly relevant to human that's why it makes sense to do those studies in animals and then finally eventually when you do the studies in animals what is your final goal whatever data we get we try to predict the parameters or predict the efficacy or the toxicity in human from the animal data right so as i have talked about and in a separate class we will completely talk about we will completely cover extrapolation how do you do extrapolation of data from animal species to human it's called allometric scaling and uh, there are few principles based on which allometric scaling works and we'll cover that in detail in a separate class so these are the reasons why we have to use animals in drug discovery and development also as you can see if there's no animal research see apart from being ethical and all is fine but at the end of the day by this animal research eventually what are we trying to do we're trying to screen molecules or drug candidates which are going to be used for one or the other disease treatment or prevention right if it is vaccine so the point is this is just an example uh, she is a 9 year old uh, cancer patient so you see there are so many dreadful diseases which are yet uh, not within the control of human i mean we don't have short short solutions although now a lot of research have happened we have we have made significant progress in cancer treatment and uh, few kinds of cancer can completely be treated but still there are other types of cancer where still you don't have short short medicines so that's why disease like this you need some medicines right we need cure as as a, as a human race uh, like as you know every now and then we are challenged with one or the other diseases new bacteria or new viruses like covid being the best example so there is always going to be a need to come up with better solutions in terms of treatment or prevention so this research is utmost importance and hence the role of animal testing will always be there as i discussed earlier while talking about alternatives to animal research we can definitely reduce the number of animals to be used but animal research we can't just get away with we will have to use animals for drug discovery and development okay so just a, a few figures i put it up again these are old figures but uh, this has definitely increased so nearly 10 lakh children under the age of 5 they survive each year after accidental exposure to potentially poisonous substances thousands of pet cats and dogs are vaccinated each year and those spared from disease such as feline leukemia distemper parvo rabies even in human so many vaccines we are taking so you see by taking all these vaccines and uh, in animals and human basically we are trying to prevent infection from many many diseases 
right? So imagine a scenario, a world where there are no vaccines. How do we survive, right? So that's where uh, animal research uh, credit goes to animal research and uh, our access to this laboratory animal facilities and animal research that we are able to test these vaccines and the potential drugs in animals first and the best molecules we are able to then take further into human trial and then finally uh, successfully a drug candidate or vaccine can be launched so you see there is a huge role of animal research into this so what are the species so let's talk about species so most common species in drug discovery development preclinical research essentially for in vivo testing is rats mice and other rodents right so this is just a picture of how they look like on the downside if you see the the uh, picture which shows it's a nude mice so we call it a skid mice severely compro uh, severely compromised immunodeficient mice means this particular skid mice or a nude mice as you can see they don't have hair that is their characteristic uh, you can make out but the point is this model has been developed to uh, use in cancer research how because they don't have any active immune system inside their body they have been genetically modified such uh, in a such manner that now they don't have an active immune system so what happens if you want to study any cancer drug uh, so you want to see the efficacy so first you need to develop those cancer models in mice so like in human in animals also the first reaction is resistance body's own immune system any foreign thing gets into your body so the body's first reaction is resistance it tries to counteract that so what happens is if you inject any cell lines to elicit any uh, tumor or, or cancerous growth in animals so that you have a disease model of cancer in animals then you can test your drug but animal body will not accept that because of their inbuilt immunity so what scientists have done they have come up with this uh, genetically modified uh, model which is kid mice where they don't have internal immune system so if you inject a cell line you know, to elicit a tumor or a cancer finally what happens is uh, from the body except that over a period of time they will develop a tumor so then you can dose them with your anti-tumor drug or anti-cancer drug uh, for oncology applications and look for the efficacy of your molecule so those are called skid mice the other ones are normal vister rats uh, or sd rats spread dolly these are the strains which we use and on the right hand side i just mentioned which all uh, vaccines or research areas these animals have been used like diphtheria typhoid aging cancer kidney disease bone research everywhere we use rats mice indiscriminately so let's talk about mouse. The smallest species in the chain is mouse, which is called as mus musculus. It is a scientific name of it. They are very timid, gentle, very easy to handle, photophobic, and they are nocturnal. So they are very highly active in night. So they are uh, very small but very quick, uh, but very gentle species to handle. If you talk about their life scale, a uh, life cycle, you know they have a lifespan of around 1.5 to 2.5 years. On, upon birth, they weigh around only one gram, very light in weight. Winning, when they separate from their parents, the winning weight is 12 to 18 grams. They are born hairless and their eyes are closed when they are born. Okay, Their complete hair growth will happen on 10th day from the day they are born. On 12th day, actually they open their eyes. And on 13th and 14th day, they start eating the food. So this is the entire life cycle of a smallest species of laboratory animals mouse which are indiscriminately used in drug discovery and development research so from an animal husbandry point of view you can keep them in a propylene cages in each cage you can keep one to three uh, small cages are there later on we'll see some pictures of, of those cages but you can keep one to three mice in a cage you can keep more but uh, they're coprophagic in nature so sometimes uh, they can eat each other so that's why it's better to keep them just one to three in a small mouse cage. And uh, if they are too young, they're, sim they're just born, then eight to 10 young ones can be kept in single cage. Okay. And the bedding material, 
what we use is corn cob, paddy husk, sawdust, wooden chips, paper dust, uh, paper shreddings. All this thing can be used as a bedding material in your uh, in your cage for the mice. Okay. So what are the temperature conditions? So environmental conditions by CPCSA guidelines, it should be within five degrees. So basically, it's a to plus or minus one degree but uh, in a range if i talk anywhere between 20 to 25 degrees celsius should be the room temperature where you're keeping them the relative humidity again ideal is between 45 to 65 but as per cpcsa guideline the range is between 30 to 70 percent relative humidity in an animal house room is acceptable the light as i said they're nocturnal animals so the light uh, hours should be minimum 12 hours and then it can vary sometimes people keep 14 hours darkness 12 hours uh, of light or vice versa that you can decide but 12 12 hours of light and dark cycle they need okay and they're very sensitive to noise so not more than 80 decibels of noise level should be there in the laboratory animal facility so why i'm sharing this is because many colleges i visit and uh, many of the pharmacy colleges i have visited and uh, uh, of course they are good colleges but uh, somehow the the animal house now i see of course uh, of uh, of late the last five years i've seen a lot of positive changes uh, that have happened in colleges even pharmacy colleges have realized that uh, if they really want to train their students in a way that uh, they can be absorbed by industry then they have to maintain those standards so now many colleges are visit uh, i see the animal facilities are really up to the standards but uh, many colleges still they don't maintain the minimum required conditions as per cpcse in spite of the fact that they are registered with cpcse so for them i would just like to say that uh, you don't need huge investment with minimal investment you can still maintain the conditions as per cpcse and that is just this few conditions which i mentioned like temperature, relative humidity, light, noise, and a few other conditions. If you maintain, you can still have a good animal facility within the college or university premises. So, in terms of nutrition, they are generally given uh, feed ad libitum unless uh, you have a specific uh, requirement as per your study design that you want to make them devoid of food, like in a fasting condition. Then you may not feed them uh, and keep them for fasting. But otherwise, by and large, we keep them uh, ad libitum, means uh, sufficient food. Uh, you can keep those uh, ready-made uh, pellets are available, which has protein, carbohydrate, fat, uh, all the concentrations uh, uh, are there. And they are pelleted food, which you can use. Okay, Water is always given through a water bottle uh, into the cage. And it uh, also, it is ad libitum, it is supplied. So where do you use mice? For many of the pharmacological studies, for toxicology studies, for carcinogenicity studies, for teratogenicity, for disease diagnosis, and for behavioral studies, mice as the most preferred model uh, under laboratory animals. Okay, so that's the usage of mouse. And another species which is equally important in animal testing in drug discovery is rat. Right, these are few strains I've mentioned. Most common strain is Wister rats or spread dolly rats. On the right hand side, you can see the picture. They're white in uh, color, uh, skin color, and they're beautiful animals, very easy to handle. Uh, gently, you can handle them, and then the very easily they can be manipulated. Life cycle up to three years, birth weight is around three grams. They are also born hairless and their eyes are closed, and the complete hair growth happens on 10th day. So they're mute basically when they're born, but by 10th day, complete hair growth would happen. By 13th day, they open their eyes, and from 16th day onwards, they can start eating the pallets which you are providing to them. So breeding, the maturity age is seven weeks. Breeding age is 80 days. They do have Easter cycle of four to five days. When you keep them with the males and female, they can still uh, mate, and, and then uh, they can conceive. So gestation period is only 20 to 21 to 23 days and there also offspring how many offsprings they produce is at a time 6 to 10 and winning period uh, that is the time when you separate them from their parents is also 21 days so in nutshell uh, friends what i would like to emphasize here is as you can see their entire gestation period 
or is is so small, right? So when you try to study the drug throughout the life period, like say for example, I have to test a drug in human, then the average lifespan would be somewhere around 65 years. So you can never study drug for so long. Like same is the case with other species, but whereas with laboratory animals like rats, mice, and rabbits and guinea pigs and hamster, the advantage is you can study the entire life cycle, right? If you want to really keep them like long-term carcinogenicity studies we do, you can test them for two years and within two years you can see the entire uh, toxicity uh, ex uh, potential of a drug. So because of this shorter life cycle, also they are preferred. Nowadays a new model has come which is zebrafish and we'll take a separate lecture when we talk of toxicology. Zebrafish, the biggest advantage is in 24 hours the entire life cycle is over. So you can very quickly uh, check your uh, toxicity potential of your drug uh, with zebrafish. Uh, mainly for aquatic and uh, for ecotoxicity also sometimes we use zebrafish. So I'll talk about it later when we get into toxicology. So this was about rat. Again, you can keep them in polypropylene cages. You can keep them in individually uh, cage, uh, conventional cages, uh, racking system, or you can keep them in a uh, in a uh, IVF, uh, uh, say IVCs, uh, individually ventilated cages are available. You can keep them in that. The temperature, and the environmental conditions are pretty much same. Relative humidity of 30 to 60, 12, 12 hours of light and darkness, and temperature of uh, 90 to 23, so almost same uh, temperature. They have coprophagus, as I said, so you can still keep up to three uh, rats in a same cage. They are also used all the uh, areas where you can use mice. Guinea pig is also another uh, widely used um, laboratory species. Again, weight at the breeding is around 400 grams, female would be 650 grams. Uh, 1 is to 10 ratio is what we keep. Winning weight is 180 and floor or you can you can have a large cages with a bedding material and you can keep more number of guinea pigs into that. There you have more liberty with the temperature from 18 to 26 degree. Relative humidity and light cycles are same and in nutrition if you want a well maintained colonies of, uh, of uh, guinea pigs then you should make sure the feed which you eat, which you saw them should have fiber and protein from 10 to 15 and 18 to 20 percent and you have to supply vitamin C additionally. So that is their separate requirement which may not be the case with rats and mice. Where are they used? For TB, for anthrax, for leptospirosis, uh, all this thing uh, for diagnosis purpose also, guinea pig is the better model. Going to the larger species like cattle and swine, okay, so even they are useful, right? Where, like in smallpox, in organ transplants, in diabetic research, in heart diseases, arthritis, osteoporosis, there are so many diseases where even large animals are of use. Rabbits, again, very widely used, just like rats and rabbits, uh, rats and mice. Rabbits are also widely used species in a preclinical scenario, as you can, as you, most of you will be knowing that for the cataract and all, you know, rabbits uh, are the are the best model to study. Even for any ophthalmological studies, uh, rabbits are the better model. Okay, and then uh, many a times uh, we collect even antibodies also from rabbits. So rabbits are also very good model in preclinical. The most common rabbits which were used in discovery is New Zealand white. You do have Soviet chinchilla also, but New Zealand white is most widely used animals in research. Breeding age four to five months for female and for male it is six months. They're induced ovulators, hand mating uh, adapted, the gestation is around 32 days. And again, litter size is up to nine. Now, husbandry cages slightly varies from rats and mice because they are bigger in their size. So, there are stainless steel cages, individual cages are available. You can keep males and females separate or you can keep one or two in a same cage, uh, males or females. Okay. And there should always be a nest box and, uh, and it is always said that for rabbits, of course, other animals also, but for rabbits more so, you should have enrichment of the environment. Right. So, you should put something 
for their uh, for their enrichment uh, of the environment, uh, the micro environment in which they are placed. So uh, enrichment is an additional thing we keep apart from water, bedding material. Anything additional you give them like a provision of play area. So that itself becomes an enrichment for rabbits. So it is always preferred in case of rabbits. Temperature, relative humidity and light requirements are almost same. Uh, only light they need for maybe 12 to 14 hours. Okay. Their feed when you uh, supply, you have to make sure that 12 to 22 percent of fiber and minimum 12 percent of protein for their maintenance. And the, if they are in a growing phase, then up to 15 to 70 percent you can keep them for growing. Where are they used? As I said, for virology, for hypertension, for cardiology, embryology, serology. A lot of antibody uh, collection we do. So for drug testing, rabbits can be used. Dogs. So you may wonder that how come dogs? But you see, you try to you know, do the uh, extrapolation of data. And it is very much true that when you try to extrapolate data from the lowest species, which is rats or mice, to human, the, the gap is too much, right? From a human to rats and mice. So the extrapolation may not be that accurate. So we always prefer in, in drug discovery and development uh, of uh, a research scenario that whenever you try to generate data, so or you know, Try to have one species. You may use rats and mice, which are more most preferred. But as per guidelines, also one non-rodent species you should definitely use, so that you have extrapolation from rats and mice to dogs or to monkeys, and from that to human. So you see now there are more data points for better extrapolation. So that's where dogs are being used. But these are specifically uh, these are a specific breed which is being used. Right, these are beagle dogs. As you can see, the downside that's a picture of a beagle dog. So, beagle dog is widely used as a uh, species for toxicity as well as efficacy studies, also sometimes or majorly for a toxicity data generation. We always use beagle dog. Okay, so uh, yes, for uh, vision research, for cardiovascular research, for therapeutic use of insulin, bone marrow transplantation, respiratory research. So many areas dogs can, be, can also be used for research mind you not the stray dogs i'm talking about beagle dogs specifically their breed, their breeding is done so that they can be used for research purposes then there are frog fish reptiles so frogs and all i think now has almost stopped uh, like when i was studying 20 25 years ago we use frogs indiscriminately uh, in our school days but I think nowadays they're not being used. But fish, uh, as I'm saying, that zebra fish is, is one of the most recent. Uh, of course, it was there since long. But uh, its importance in research has come up uh, very lately uh, in a recent past. And now uh, the first model, uh, always animal model, is zebra fish. And there are definitely advantages to that that we will understand later on. But uh, as I said, the life cycle is within 24 hours. You can study the entire uh, life cycle of a zebra fish. So very good model to study the toxicity. And they are transparent. Even their organ systems can be seen with the naked eye or at least with a microscope. You can easily see their uh, organ systems, internal organ system. So they are beautiful models to be used early. They are called as zebra fish. As I said, Non-human primates, which are used, and uh, I would like to uh, first let me talk about the positives, and then uh, some uh, misconceptions are there. I'll try to clear that. Uh, Non-human primates, uh, chimps, monkeys are considered to be close to human. So whenever you are testing your drugs uh, in in laboratory animals, either you can take then beagle dog or chimp. Second species where you want to test your drug and you try to extrapolate this data into human. As you can imagine, uh, we have descendant, uh, Homo sapiens have descendant from chimpanzees only, so they are more closely related to us than dog or rabbit. So that's why uh, primates have an important role to play. However, all the 
uh, I mean, there there are hardly on a, on a fingertip I can count that many facilities in India who have got this permission to use primates. So not every college, uh, of course, I'm sure no college have primates usage facility. So no companies, I'm talking about research companies and contract research organizations in India, uh, hardly a couple of them have got a permission to use primates. So for polio vaccine, rubella, hepatitis, drug uh, or for measles research or anesthesia research or even I would say uh, usual drugs which we use uh, in, in our research purpose uh, the, for their testing I think uh, the primates is a good model but at the same time just this assumption that homo sapiens have descended from children, that's why they are so re closely related to us so every drug needs to be tested in primates then the extrapolation will be better is also not true okay I'll tell you how because what happens is many times what are the data we try to extrapolate we try to extrapolate metabolism data the clearance data so metabolism or clearance they are basically driven by enzymes and you'll be surprised to see that there are few enzymes which are expressed in chimpanzees uh, SIP enzymes which are not at all expressed in human so what happens is you may see a data from chimpanzee where there is high metabolism Okay, or maybe some reactive metabolite is forming after metabolism, but that may not be the case with human because that particular enzyme may not be expressing in human. So uh, blindly saying this that because it's a larger species closer to human, we should always test in primates also doesn't serve the purpose. Now that with our understanding of genome uh, and then the expression of this uh, polymorphism and expression of cytochrome P450 enzymes in different species, you can very well choose which that to use for extrapolation of the data right so always try and see that the speed uh, that uh, the enzymes uh, who are responsible for metabolism of your drug where are they expressed try to pick up those strains otherwise they'll be disconnect like i have shared one of the slide last week that uh, many times drugs are being withdrawn from the market after being launched successfully because of lack of efficacy and then uh, in clinical trial also many of the times because of lack of efficacy drug fails why because there's a difference so when you do preclinical research the concept is that you should concentrate more on understanding the genome as well and try to correlate it very closely to human so any species where enzyme expression is same or similar to what we have in human please use those models right it may not be possible in all the studies or the disease target but wherever it is possible please try to follow that so that your extrapolation will be more accurate right so, uh, so that's about uh, primates so in summary you can see i just uh, the number of species and uh, where all they are used like hamster gerbil bats dog cats homo sapiens birds they are all being used for different uses maybe later on you can go through all that thing in detail so what is the advantage of using lab animals we have understood why we should use animals we have discussed what are the main normal species of animals being used in research now let's talk about the advantages of using this lab animals as i said the size is small the lab animals rats mice rabbits all of them are small in size so they're easy to handle right you can have a controlled environmental condition as i already mentioned that you can keep temperature uh, you can keep relative humidity noise level light intensity everything within a controlled environmental condition you can rear this animal so that is another advantage genetic purity is possible because their life cycle is is, is smaller you can do breedings and make sure that you get highly pure uh, genetic pure genetically pure animals they are highly prolific and even breeding can be controlled right you can plan experiments where you do breedings right because it's only 21 days of gestation period with two to three days of estrus you can plan the mating and you can plan the breeding so that's called as controlled breeding so this all the advantages are there if you use lab animals so all these lab animals rats mice dog guinea pig hamster uh, even rabbits 
primates, beagle dogs, where all they are used? They are used in drug discovery, especially to understand the ADME, absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, for safety evaluation and for efficacy, which is potency testing and for safety testing of vaccines and diagnostics. Okay, so this is the application uh, of animal usage. Apart from that, for the chemical testing, uh, there are like studies, safety studies, like you can do a quick toxicity testing, an actual toxicity study, maybe 14 or 20 do 90 day toxicity study, which is chronic toxicity studies. We can do specific toxicity studies like carcinogenicity, reproductive tox, genotox, irritation test. So we will be discussing each of this toxicity in detail when we talk about toxicology. So what are these studies? How they are being done? Which is the guideline we follow? What are the outcome of those studies? And what is the design of that studies? Everything we will discuss study by study. Go to toxicology topic. So coming back to environment and ecology, uh, there also you can do aquatic toxicity and chronic toxicity using any of this laboratory animals. Here, I just talked about uh, just a very quick example. Here, it's taken from a veterinary drug approval process, but yes, this is what is being followed there. Uh, just an example of an antibiotic uh, for bovine respiratory disease (BRD). So first, what you have to do is in discovery and development phase, uh, I would say pretty much the approach is same. The procedure is slightly different, but the approach of drug discovery development for a veterinary application is just the same as we do it in human. Okay, so you do have to have an in vitro assay in place. Okay, using uh, cell base here they are used since it's an antibiotic they use Pasteurella multocida many Hemia hemolytica they are used so using in vitro assays and they look for the inhibition of this if they get a good MIC means the antibiotic is good and they look for which is the structure which works so it starts with an in vitro assay you can use a bovine model of induce you can use a bovine respiratory disease bovine and then look for in vivo efficacy you can also do you can do a subcut application or intravenous application and then study the ADME in the live animals, right? And then uh, truck and shoot and mimic the transportations of the of bovine, uh, preliminary target animal safety studies you do. And then finally, uh, it goes for manufacturing and then uh, you have to register. So why I put this example here is just to showcase like we are all throughout talked about human drug research. Even the veterinary drug research uh, is given on same principles. You need screening, identification, lead optimization, you need in vitro assays, in vivo studies to study ADM, you need efficacy study, you need safety studies, and only then you can get your drug approved, even if it is for veterinary. So, as you can see, veterinary medicines, uh, uh, there, there are so many uh, additional parameters which will not be there in the, in the, the human. The, the reason being the application because oh, when you do it in animals, few of the animals they are being used as food or oh, they, they serve as food for human too, right? So there could be chances that uh, we may get exposed uh, to either uh, the milk or milk we, we utilize or the meat or beef or whatever uh, non uh, food we eat. Uh, those uh, are not done, you may get exposed to that drug as well. So that's why uh, the safety standards, the efficacy, the uh, studies uh, requirement, all are same uh, even for veterinary drug because eventually you may get exposed to that. A human can also get exposed. So there are five major technical sec uh, sections within the approval of a veterinary drug that is target animal safety. The, Ask for that data, the effectiveness, which is the say, efficacy, human food safety, as I was mentioning, that actually we may util, uh, we may consume that food. So human food safety also has to be established, and then the manufacturing, not because they use in animals, so they can be manufactured anywhere. No, the CMC part of it, that is chemistry manufacturing and control, should also be well documented and as per the guidelines and finally because these animals uh, they they defecate their urine is open so there's a chance that your drug can get exposed to the environment also 
correct because through urine or feces the drugs may come out and that's where we also have to study the environmental impact of those drugs as well so i just wanted to show you a comparison that human uh, the the science is same for the drug research but there are some additional parameters which are applied to veterinary drug research you should be aware of it as a pharmacy or a, or a microbiology or a biotechnology student so if you are uh, really interested in the guidelines you can visit www uh, ichsec.org which is ich guidelines are really uh, are detailed mentioned over there okay so let's talk about ethics in animal use so of course uh, i talked about uh, why should we use animals which animals are used what are the advantages of using animals now we are moving to ethics okay so you may uh, argue that uh, if we are talking about ethics we should not at all use the live animals right that could come to your mind first but as i already explained to you that human uh, drug research in the sense in order to bring in novel medicines novel vaccines into market animal research is must okay so we have to do it but while doing it while utilizing this animals for research we can always make sure that all the animal welfare and ethics practices are maintained so that's where ethics comes into the play as buddha said when a man has pity on all living creatures then only he is noble even darwin says the love for all living creatures is the most noble attribute of a man right so at least uh, see two three things i'll come to that in a subsequent slides but uh, you can always stop using animals indiscriminately right wherever possible please try to reduce the number of animals first avoid using animals if at all you feel that by doing in vitro data or generating in vitro data after doing in vitro assay you can really take some decisions about your molecule please avoid using animals don't just go blindly uh, testing every molecule which a chemist synthesizes into live system at least that you can do so that is ethics right and please i was talking about environmental conditions right for each of the animals so please provide them ideal conditions so it is definitely good for animals as long as they are alive they have very feasible optimal environmental conditions and whenever uh, from a scientific perspective if you provide them ideal conditions they are well maintained the, the data which you get out of it is also going to be reliable and reproducible so that's the reason ethics is not only important for animal sake for us also because if you maintain best practices animal welfare practices data which you get out of experiment is also more authentic yeah so we have the regulation uh, in our country which decide the usage of animal so please remember it is called cpcsca okay committee for purpose of uh, for purpose of supervision on purpose of uh, prevention of cruelty and supervision of experiments on animals okay so cpc uh, is a statutory body under ministry of environment and forestry and in every single animal house okay to all my friends who are joining uh, today uh, today's lecture in your pharmacy college or in any of your colleges if there is an animal house please go and ask is this animal house registered with cpcsca because it is clearly defined that if you want to do any animal testing or animal research the facility should be registered with cpcsca so as a as a uh, first principle of animal welfare you should do this please go back to your colleges and uh, inquire if those call if those facilities are registered with cpcsca or not if not they can always apply and get the facility registered so that is the first step okay now once a facility is registered with cpcsca what they ask is ministry of environment and forestry uh, they have uh, asked each of this uh, institute that you should have institutional animal ethics committee if you have an animal house your facility your college your university should have institutional animal ethics committee what is the formation 
So it is given in the guideline, there should be eight members in this committee. The chairman of that member uh, of that community would be there who mostly is the head of the organization where the institute, where the facility is. There are two biological scientists on that committee. A laboratory animal house in charge should be there. It could be a pharmacy, pharmacology background or a veterinarian or a zoology background, but you need animal house in charge. You need animal lab animal veterinarian who is uh, a veterinary doctor he should be on the committee one external scientist who is outside your college maybe from other institute or academia or industry and then cpcaca themselves will nominate one member on that committee which will be appointed by cpcaca ministry of environment and forestry and that fellow would be called a cpcaca nominee or link nominee and we need one person who is not a scientist, who is not with an animal house, uh, animal uh, handling background, but he is a socially aware person who has nothing to do with animal handling. So the reason is he will always bring in the welfare point uh, perspective whenever any protocol goes for approval to this committee for usage of animal. So you see, CPCAC has thought very. Uh, what do you call precisely and in the, the formation of the IAC is such that that uh, the protocol would be scrutinized from all angles there will be scientists there will be biological scientists there will be a veterinarian there will be animal house in charge there will be an external scientist from outside your organization who should be unbiased and then you have a socially aware person a social social activist so that you will always uh, question why you want to use animals so uh, that keeps a check on you you can always uh, uh, put up your protocol with animal number use, uh, number of animals to be used justification for that and uh, if at all uh, you can you can do experiment without animals even that can be uh, proved by that so uh, so that's the formation of cpcfa and iaec institutional animal ethics committee so what's the role of CPCCA? Their role is to issue a guideline on animal housing and management. They approve animal house. As I said, each animal facility in the entire country uh, should be registered with CPCCA. They scrutinize each and every research program to, animal, to approve animal use, as I said, to IAC. Because IAC has to approve this. And since the CPCCA normally sits on that committee, uh, they actually finally, after uh, reviewing the protocol, and if they are convinced, they approve the protocol for usage of animal at your facility and the most important role of CPCAC is to minimize and rationalize the use of animals in experiments okay so there are three hours uh, i'm sorry this is an old slide uh, but now there are four hours okay so first three are replace as we already talked about this covered in detail use hepatocytes use enterocytes use all the cell based models wherever possible as alternatives to animal usage that is called replace reduce as i already mentioned you can always reduce the number of animals right of course you should have a sufficient number of animals where statistically significant data can be generated out of it but indiscriminate usage definitely can be avoided can be avoided use smaller species so this is reduce refine Try to use procedures, right? You have to use these animals. The least we can do is make sure that your procedures are painless wherever possible. Minimize the stress by providing them the uh, ideal environmental conditions by giving them the enrichment. So at least by doing all this thing, you can do the refining of your procedures, right? So replace, refine, uh, re reduce, and refine. And redundancy, redundancy means wherever possible colleges it could be possible even in the industry it's possible that when you do a study say a adm study or a tk study i'm doing i know the half life of my drug is three uh, three hours or say 12 hours all i can do is if possible and if it is doable you can do a washout period so that within one week or two weeks the drug which you have tested has completely come out of their system now they're completely clean animals you can reuse them so at least rather than sacrificing you can reuse the animals 
thereby you can reduce the number of new animals also so that's the principle 3 hours or 4 hours concept in cpcse so management of animal house let's quickly talk about animal house uh, very quickly i'll say good quality animals will produce good quality data if you have unhealthy unhygienic not properly maintained animal facility the data also which you get from that is highly unauthentic not reproducible neither it is a quality data so we always say good quality animals so healthy optimally grown animals they should be well fed they should be disease free they should be stress free any other disease or infections should not be there in the colonies so the data which you get from that is very accurate so they should have freedom from hunger please please feed them well of course wherever fasting is required you have to keep them devoid of food but otherwise at least avoid hung, uh, avoid keeping them empty stomach avoid stress give them enrichment as much as possible pain wherever possible in your procedures use pain please do so give them ad libitum water and make sure their disease skin infection or any other disease uh, viral or bacterial disease free means it's an ideal model for you to study your pk or adme studies in this animals environment please make sure temperature as i already mentioned 22 plus or minus 1 degree always maintain relative humidity of 30 to 70 percent light dark cycle should be 12 hours minimal noise level should be below 80 percent uh, 80 lbs uh, and air exchange in your environment uh, the environment of the animal room make sure that there are minimum 15 air changes every hour right so minimum number of air exchange has to be maintained because this, if you maintain this much conditions even your small animal facility in your academic uh, uh, scenario would also be very useful you can generate very authentic reliable quality data even if you maintain only this many few parameters okay so when you house animals there are two kinds of housing which are generally being done one is conventional so you feed them you groom them vaccinate them against common diseases but not house in a special room or pen to isolate them from the rest of the environment because see please remember uh, even in conventional we keep them in the cages but within the cages we want to keep them with other animals so that uh, they are also live systems if you keep them isolated then they also have stress so they need to socialize as we human do so that's why I always keep them in colonies okay so uh, no special precautions are taken to prevent the introduction of disease into the colonies so yes this should also be uh, like uh, uh, when a conventional system is there as you can see we house animals together so basically uh, individually you're not taking any care so this is what it means but even today many of the colleges many of the institutes many of the CROs they maintain conventional housing system barrier housing so barrier housing is basically they use special cages right the bedding material the paddy has uh, paper sheddings wooden chips corn cob these are the bedding material which we use they should be sterilized the room air which is coming through please do not use uh, normal split ac instead use extra units right so your air which is passing through can be made to pass through a hepa filter which is 0.5 micron uh, 0.5 micron and uh, uh, along with that when it really uh, comes out uh, the air that is also 0.5 uh, micron filter air okay just one second yes so uh, when we say just give me a moment all right sorry there was a phone call in between yeah so uh, the air which comes into the animal room should be filtered through hepa filter and the exhalation the air which is going exhaust going out of your room should also be filtered through 0.5 so 
it is completely sterile environment in general we say that animal facilities should be class one lakh facility means the air which is coming inside the facility is 0.5 micron filtered the going out is also 0.5 micron filtered so that is class one lakh facility okay so that's called barrier housing Caging means make sure you can put them in a cage but it should be comfort so each animal space requirements are very well defined in cpcsa guideline you can download this document from the cpcsa site uh, the guideline is freely available and for each animal the space requirements are defined which will decide that in each of the cage mice or rat cage or a rabbit cage or for a guinea pig how many animals you can keep in that correct and it should be transparent so that you can see through and through filtered and if possible individually ventilated correct bedding is a part of the animal's environment right if you don't keep like we we sleep in our bed uh, generally of course people who, are bad, who, who suffer from backache they tend to sleep just like that uh, without any uh, mattress but we always need a mattress in our bed right that gives us a cushion feeling so same way you have to give bedding material to the animals laboratory animals which are paddy straw husk uh, wooden chips paper shreddings so these are all or corn cobs these are used as bed so they become a part of the environment and we have to make sure it is sterile uh, and because they will defecate they will urinate within the same bedding material so you have to always make sure that it is sterile so uh, sanitization is very important now uh, if covid was not there i'm sure people many people were not knowing what is sanitation but now we all know we want sanitation we want hygiene we want sterile conditions right so in animal house also it is equally important you should clean so since they are defecating they are urinating in the same cage there is a lot of lot of soiled uh, smelling bedding material which needs to be removed and then you have to make sure that uh, the cages the flooring the walls everything is sanitized completely they are disinfectant they are uh, disinfected regularly if possible in an ideal animal house daily morning and evening disinfection should be carried out this is uh, uh, this is called enrichment uh, environment enrichment of course we don't want you to uh, so uh, beer and uh, other things to your animals but yes this is just an example to showcase what is an enrichment means you are at your leisure right so on the right hand side as you can see for rats and mice because uh, this, because of their nature their behavior they uh, if you provide them with such tunnels kind of thing like this is a tunnel they simply play they are so playful and they are so happy same way if you keep some uh, propylene uh, channels or staircase kind of thing they just love it this is for mice this is for tunnels for rats so an attempt to reduce the stress is enrichment okay the structural environment consists of component of primary exposure uh, enclosure such as resting board perches all these things right social environment means contact with each other don't uh, keep them in isolation they should always be in a group so that they are at least uh, social correct okay? so that's called enrichment of course uh, there there is enough literature available that uh, people have done studies with enrichment without enrichment does it really impact your data and it's really interesting you will be see you will be surprised to see that yes there are papers who suggest that you get real good data when you provide them enrichment in their environment immediate environment but there are papers which suggest that by enrichment there is no change in the data quality so so it is it is still debatable but i i would personally suggest that wherever possible please apply and, uh, and uh, supply them with some enrichment okay like this you see they, they like to do exercise in this also small tunnel kind of thing they have kept it right for beagle dogs also you see this is the area provided to them so paper material for mice so they can build the the nest housing compatible animals of the same species together for species typical behavior grooming mating so if they are in a social environment all these behaviors are encouraged 
so that's why we say that wherever possible do the enrichment so at the same time please make sure that you are not really introducing any infection into your animal colonies so please make sure that whatever enrichment material you use please clean it as and when possible and make sure that everything is very sterile the whole area is disinfected okay so health monitoring as i said uh, enrichment is important environment is important stress free uh, status of animal is important at the same time they should be devoid of disease right if they themselves have one or the other disease then their one of the systems in their body say liver or kidney or any other organ is affected infected then the data which you get out of those studies in animals would be compromised it may not be accurate so you want to make sure that they are devoid of viral bacterial fungal and parasitic infestation and viral bacterial fungal infections so there are diagnostic methods you can use pcr elisa cell cultures and you can really diagnose take the urine sample or a blood sample from a colony not from all the animals you can take a sample size or uh, say from a 10 animals one or from 100 animals you can take from five samples and make sure that uh, the whole colony is free from viral bacterial or fungal infections what are the precautions we have to use while using the laboratory animals so lab animals um, Please, now I'm shifting the gear, coming to human. Like we are, or you are going to handle the animals. So, what are the care you should take? So, please remember, these animals can transmit disease. Okay, so they can transmit disease to humans. There could be some allergies, which may. Uh, I mean, there are some humans. Uh, many of us have allergy, are allergic to dust, pollens, and all. So we should be careful while dealing with these animals because they got a very smooth fur across their body, and that can uh, not be seen by naked eye, and it can really make you allergic, right? If you have yourself some disease, so for some reason you are immunosuppressed, then please don't uh, make sure that you don't really work with these animals. Otherwise, you may uh, attain some disease. And if you don't adopt appropriate safety measures or precautions, then also you can uh, be exposed to the disease from animals okay and most of this uh, many of you who who have worked with these animals would know that even rats and mice when you open their incisors they got a two big incisors coming right from their mouth in the front so if you are not careful you may have the bite injuries from them as well and as i said allergies are very common so these are the precautions we should take so what are the common allergens like fur, urine, serum, protein, tissue, saliva, dander, all these things can come as common allergens from animals, laboratory animals, and they can be exposed to you. And through which route they can get exposed to you or we can get exposed to those things through their bedding material because all this thing is shredded in their bedding while you handle them, while you are collecting the sample or you are taking that uh, all the as a soiled or uh, dirty litter and uh, the bedding material and trying to throw away so you're handling that so doing any of this exercise you can get exposed to this allergens so uh, these are the uh, disorders right which you can see and symptoms like redness uh, itchiness it could be a contact arctic area allergic conjunctivitis rhinitis asthma anaphylaxia all these thing disorders can be seen in the people who are handling these animals or who are working very closely with the animals what are the preventive measures again as you have seen the most dreadful disease in today's scenario is covid but again there are preventive measures which you can take and you can still avoid infection from covid at least getting yourself exposed to that so same way you can also avoid exposure to those allergens just by using uh, the knowledge first of all you should know which species you are handling the conditions where you are working use ventilated cages use your mask pro personal protective wear frequent hand washing clothing just don't go uh, like in colleges many a time i see people don't even wear apron and gloves and they just go and handle please don't do that uh, i see many colleges they maintain all the personal protective wear and then they 
handle this animal so you should do that uh, for allergies to latex like uh, latex gloves are there you can use non latex disposable gloves and if you have any symptoms you can always uh, immediately go for some medication so this is the preventive measures okay just uh, bite and injury data so like accidental injuries associated with non human primate exposure at two regional primate research centers in usa between 88 and 93 this is uh, just a paper where you can see that uh, what are the incidences which can happen right so you can see needle stick injuries scratches cuts uh, this is this is where it is uh, it is already mentioned okay so sharps and all uh, again i am getting too much into details but uh, these are very common uh, things for any animal facility when you do your animal testing so sharps and all please please maintain your respective state biomedical waste guidelines okay and and uh, avoid uh, getting any injuries from the sharps and whatever biological waste in form of animal carcass tissues organs blood cottons or uh, whatever you used syringe needle please discard them in uh, in the prescribed procedure as per the uh, biomedical waste guidelines okay generally we use hydrogen peroxide 1% solution or a hypochlorite solution in which we dump all this thing and then finally it is uh, it is autoclaved and then biomedical waste person comes and takes it many organizations have uh, the disposal pits uh, biomedical disposal they do it within their premises they should also be following all the relevant guidelines for biomedical waste okay for understanding why you are handling this laboratory animal these are all the list of zoonotic disease which can happen zoonotic means um, they can transmit from animals to human or from human to animals right like rabies salmonellosis gi diseases tularemia arthropod infestations these are all the uh, uh, these are all the disease which can affect multiple animal species okay the species the disease which are affecting the non human primates like herpes measles hepatitis a Majorly ships goats, they are contagious eczema, Q fever. Primarily dogs and cats, you have got bites and toxoplasmosis. And primarily, which affect rodents, especially they are lymphocytic choreomeningitis, rat liver, uh, lead, uh, red bite fever, and hantavirus. So I would suggest that whenever a person, uh, as a student, you have a research project to work on usage of this laboratory animals, or you have a staff uh, member in your a facility who is working on animals on laboratory animals please make sure that at least they have tetanus injection prior tetanus vaccination and hepatitis b vaccination i would always suggest this two vaccination should always be done before you actually start using those uh, handling those animals okay so if there are any accidental bites from those uh, laboratory animals you can avoid uh, the infection spread because you have taken tetanus injection so that's the reason these two vaccinations i would always recommend if you are handling this animals okay hand washing please remember before you handle the animals and after you handle before you handle for the safety of animals and after you handle some infection you should not carry from those animals so this hand washing is very important no need to inform anything about hand washing in today's scenario because 20 second hand wash uh can keep you away from covid uh, so i think people across the world have realized the importance of hand washing now right before entering and leaving the animal rooms you should take care uh, after removing the gloves after completing a procedure after any suspected contamination or handling the animals you should always wash your hands waste as i already mentioned the carcass the the organs tissue blood any other body fluids coming from that should be double bagged frozen until it is disposed and if you are doing a deep burial or incineration as i was mentioning the many of the people many of the facilities have incineration uh, instrument or incineration facility within the premises please uh, use it wherever possible and you should always properly dispose the animal waste and bedding material no no need to explain this you should always wear protective wear which is your 
gloves, your mask, your head mask, your hand gloves, your face mask, your apron, your shoe covers. So you should always uh, uh, and then uh, safety goggles also you should use so that those uh, dust particles or allergens do not enter in your eyes. So laboratory animal care developed into a science now because uh, nutrition, their fields. Suppose pharmacy student or, or uh, biotechnology student, if your interest is uh, in genetics and all, you can actually get into genetics and breeding of animal in animal facility. If you are from microbiology, you can always be a part of health monitoring uh, where you can take the samples, do microbial assays or run PCR or other diagnostic assays. Uh, biotechnology, they give their inputs when you actually want to do some intervention, genetic mutation or, or genetic intervention in animals, uh, your knowledge can be used and you will also understand the, the the importance of different genetic models being used because inbred, knockout strains, gene deficient, all these models and it's science. In Animal House, uh, many, many scientists really work on this to come up with uh, with a new model of research, right? And then there's a huge scope for housing engineering people because the whole system is environment controlled. We prefer to use HVACs. So you should have uh, AC units, you have filtration units, all those things in place. So housing engineering is also a big scope, right? So uh, why I have explained so much in detail uh, today about usage of animal and its application because that's a requirement in industry because industries uh, they need trained people okay even academia they need trained people uh, who can do all this thing for them in animal house right and then uh, even if you go to other countries and try to work in in a CRO industry or in a preclinical facility then uh, that globalization and all uh, whatever is happening there also uh, there is there's a huge scope for this kind of uh, expertise of handling animal uh, species or handling uh, preclinical species, right? Or working experience in an animal house. And of course, GLP, good laboratory practice, we will cover in a separate class uh, in detail about what is good laboratory practice and uh, what it means, how it has to be maintained, and how an academic institute or a CRO can be GLP certified. So what minimal things they need to maintain, we'll discuss about that, okay? So uh, these are few institutes who offer training in laboratory animals. Few of them are in Hyderabad, uh, in Bangalore, Mumbai, in Gujarat. Uh, so you can, in Chennai, Tanuha, so, so these are all the places where you can get yourself trained in handling of the animal. So what is, this, what is the take home message for you? Always say that animal use is indispensable, yes, in biological and medical research. From a simple research aid, it has grown into a specialized science, okay? So, I see students taking purely laboratory animal research as their uh, dissertation work, as their PhD research work. So, it has grown into a specialized science, right? But a humane ethical attitude is the primary requisite. Just because we are human, just because we are advantage over lower species, just because we got access to animal species, uh, laboratory animals, doesn't mean that we, we should use these animals indiscriminately. Instead, we should always use these animals wherever it is required. And it's going to fetch you data which will be used in research in a positive way. That's where we should utilize this, but wherever we can avoid, please avoid using these animals. So there's an enormous scope and huge opportunity in academia as well as in industry. If you gain your knowledge about different animal species, about different disease models, about management of an animal facility, and about different handling procedures, then you've got a huge scope to work in industry as well as in academia okay so uh, i think uh, with this we have reached to preclinical toxicology now we can really talk about handling of animals but uh, i think i would stop here uh, and and uh, would be more than happy to take any questions uh, although we have time about half an hour but uh, i think uh, i talked a lot today so i would like to give all of you some time to 
to absorb uh, this information and when we start again on monday let us start again from a preclinical toxicology uh, point and we will deep dive into handling of animals okay and then uh, specific toxicology assays we will talk about so i will stop here and I would be more than happy to take any questions if you may have yeah thank you sir students anyone having any queries please respond in the chat box please respond anyone having any queries please respond in the chat box <coughs> sir i have posted in chat box one question please please tell me uh, let me open that so the psychological behavior of animal or human beings show any effect on working of a drug in the body okay so that's it so the question here is uh, if uh, does psychological behavior of animal or human beings show any effect on working of a drug in the body answer is yes and let me tell you to study the neurological responses the neurological or psychological behavioral studies rats and mice are the best model you know to for the psychological uh, drugs i mean to say for a neurological disorder uh, you either it is a serotonin or mood elevators or any such disease uh, i mean any such drugs uh, when they do their preclinical testing this uh, behavioral studies in animal in preclinical species is one of the very important studies and yes they exhibit all those behaviors uh, which human exhibit so that's why Uh, they are tested and yes it really impacts uh, the uh, the outcome of your drug so uh, for a neurological disorder this is exactly what we study but say for other drugs when you are testing we always recommend that we should have free uh, stress free environment to the animal so the animal should be stress free in other words if animal is under stress so stress can come because of lack of food lack of water lack of social environment or uh, maybe he is suffering from any disease so all these thing will add to the stress level so once the stress level is there now when you test a drug uh, into that animal say for a pk study maybe the data which you get the time versus the concentration uh, graph which you prepare the, the quantification data which you are getting you can make out that uh, it will be slightly different than what do you get when you dose a dr uh, drug to stress free animal so if you google search there are so many articles where they have done importance of stress in doing preclinical testing means if an animal is stressed and you test your drug and animal is stress free and you test your drug the data which you get say half life or say exposure of the animal all those data uh, parameters uh, data would vary and significantly it varies that's why we always say that we should provide them stress free environment so yes it it definitely impacts the uh, outcome of the drug if a drug tested positive for human trial and negative result for animal trial is that drug accepted or not yes of course it is accepted see i'll tell you one thing uh, your question has can have two parts one is see what is your target species for any drug research suppose your target species is human so what is important for me i want that that drug should be efficacious where in human the drug should be safe where in animals as long as it is safe and efficacious in animals it should be completely acceptable even though it is not safe in animals even though it is showing less efficacy in animals i am okay with that because eventually my target species is human as long as it is safe and efficacious there i am i am okay with that right but having said that we always see the other scenario you know what we always see good activity in in real life scenario the question is other way around in the sense the animals will show very high potency the animal studies it will be completely safe 
the moment you take them into clinical trial mostly they will show lack of efficacy or they will not be safe so that is the scenario we are facing and that's the reason many drug fails in clinical trial but we always say that this disconnect is because of difference in animal and human physiologically difference their genome is different so that's where the expression of uh, cytochrome p450 enzymes and all comes into the play so we say that try and use as much as relevant model as possible to human so nowadays there are humanized mice models are available humanized mice means some genes have been knocked off human genes have been introduced into mice and they have been bred continuously so now we have generations which are called as humanized mice so they exhibit the characteristics of a human disease what we are trying to aim or target so when you test your drug in humanized drug there is a likelihood that you may see the same effect when you go to human you see so that's the uh, that's the difference it is uh, but to answer very specifically if your question i have to answer then yes positive results in human whereas negative in animals i am okay with that as long as my target species is human thank you sir <coughs> students anyone having any again queries please respond in the chat box please respond quickly students anyone having any queries please respond in the chat box all right so uh, myshwari if there is no more question uh, then uh, i would like to just uh, convey a couple of things to the to the students uh, see me the first thing is uh, students uh, we are almost in the midway i guess uh, it's our day 7 lecture right uh, myshwari Yes. yes sir so we have reached our midway so it's a 15 day course and so far we have covered uh, drug discovery development introduction part we have talked about um, cell based i mean alternatives to animal usage which is cell based hepatocyte enterocyte models as early tools in drug discovery we have talked about in vitro adna assays Uh, which includes uh, uh, starting from solubility to octanol solubility log p uh, plasma stability microsomal stability simulated gastric fluid intestinal fluid stability studies and then in vivo testing today we have seen the whole role of uh, laboratory animals uh, in preclinical testing and then we have talked about uh, zoonotic importance from handling animal uh, handling of animals perspective so we are somewhere around Uh, midway uh, so we will still be talking about now toxicology we'll be talking about efficacy studies we'll talk about role of chemistry pharmacology uh, uh, biotechnology microbiology especially in drug discovery we'll be talking about computer aided drug designing we will also cover about uh, uh, about the initial high throughput screening assays Uh, which are uh, used throughout the drug discovery development to accelerate your research so all those things are remaining so now in with this 3 4 days of holidays i mean 3 days of holidays with you I would request all of you to 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 refresh and revise whatever we have studied although in every class we try to uh, do a small recap of what we have already learned but uh, in this uh, free time uh you can review that and if you have any questions you may ask and uh, from next 7 days uh, i will try to complete the entire course curriculum what we have agreed upon uh for this course uh, say within next 6 days i mean in next 6 classes in the 7th uh, classes uh, or say in 5 classes let me finish in 5 class 5 uh, lectures and the 6th lecture i would like to revise everything very quickly from day 1 to day 13 whatever we would have learned right and on day 15 uh, as we have discussed with maheshwari we'll do one assessment for all of you a google sheet form kind of thing so all of you can do actually that assessment and after that uh, i'm sure all of you would be able to clear you all are very intelligent smart students and i'm sure you will be able to clear that and once you clear that you will be awarded a certificate from APSSDC so this is the uh, things which is coming up for you and uh, as i said 
in this weekend so if you have any questions you can ask me when we resume our classes on monday uh, but with that uh, since today is the last day of the 2020 would like to wish all of you a very happy new year in advance and have a safe uh, healthy and a prosperous 2021 for all of you Uh, may god bless all of you and wish you all the very best for if you are student uh, for your studies if you are a professional for your career and if you are from academia then uh, maybe uh, for your uh, academic professional uh, career uh, would like to wish all of you uh, very best of luck and uh, happy new year to all of you to you as well maheshwari and uh, looking forward to connect with all of you again on monday uh, which is going to be i think uh, fourth Yeah. Of thank you sir thank you so much and wish you the same to you all your girls will come to you at the new year thank happy you. happy new year sir and one more question from the student of this 2020 year yes can human have high immunity in the body but animals have low immunity uh this is a interesting question uh i don't think it is true unfortunately uh but i would uh, i would uh, put this question for discussion for monday because i think this is a very good question to start our discussion so when i answer this question in detail or discuss not answer of course you will know the answer we will discuss this in detail on monday i personally feel this statement is not true because animals also have very good immunity okay but uh, immunity has lot to do with uh, the entire system in our body like t cells uh, uh, which are uh, expressed in humans so uh, in other uh, animal species it's a different slightly different immunity system so yes uh, immunity system itself is different but this question is debatable so uh, in a covid scenario i think all of you Uh, have understood the meaning of immunity so i think let me start my class on monday with just small not more than 2 3 minutes of discussion on immunity and i think i will be able to explain you that for particular disease uh, which are highly specific to animals they do have immunity what is required same way for human we also have immunity against many of the disease which we are supposed to be immune or any foreign particle which enters in our body so we will discuss about this so i would like to thank you for this question because this would uh, be a starting point on monday and, and uh, with covid uh, and new strains of covid coming in let's discuss few things on immunity also and yes this reminds me that i did promise in the first class that uh, during this course we will talk about the vaccines so i would definitely like to talk about vaccines also uh, because it is very relevant to today's scenario uh, from a research perspective and from the science perspective what is the role of vaccines and how actually you know, what is the difference between a natural and the acquired immunity right so we will talk about all this thing and we'll start our discussion with immunity on monday okay so thank you thank you all thank you sir. thank you so much Thank you. Have a have a great uh, weekend to all of you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. <coughs> Students, <coughs> sir has given you a task to revise all the topics what has done at the, during these seven days. Please refer and note the note the questions which you have a doubt on these seven days questions. Sir will discuss you again of your doubts and will give a clarity on that. and advance happy new year to all of you students have i think your all girls will come truth on new year and have a safe journey also in the 2021 okay students i have given the feedback form in youtube and facebook also please check it and give the feedback form based on that only we will provide the certificates okay thank you thank you sir.